Thank you. OK, so this is the test. We'll see if I manage to stay awake for um, an hour and a half. Um, so let me remind you where we ended. We defined tangent measures. I put these mysterious CIs. I think it was good that there were lots of questions about it, because this, in some sense, justified the next step I'm going to do. OK, and so the next step is roughly we're going to put a condition that you'll see is satisfied in Price's case, but it's satisfied in many other cases, and it's uh, practical. OK, so here is, here's my condition. And so let me also say, since this is supposed to mini be a mini course, not a lecture, I will attempt to prove some things. Every time I say proof, you should be worried. It was not going to contain all the details. All the details are left to you as an exercise, OK? So <laughs> but then I have complete proofs. If you, do the, if you do the homework, I get a complete proof. OK, so we have a rat on measure, and we assume let A anybody in our M. And I look at this number, C sub A, which is the limb soup as r goes to 0 of mu of b of a to r over mu of b of a r. OK? So let's think for a minute. This is the measure of a bigger ball over a measure of smaller ball. This number is bigger than 1, particular bigger than 0. And what we are going to assume is that this number is finite. So let's assume let a in rm and assume that this number, and I take it, you know, is bigger than 0. So really, I'm not assuming the 0 over 0. OK? Then for every sequence, then given a sequence ri going to 0, <coughs> um, there exists a subsequence. So this is subsequence such that if I look at mu of b of a r i k over t r i k of mu, okay, so I am choosing my c sub i's. This converges weakly to a non-zero radon measure. Moreover, okay, and so nu is a tangent here. Moreover, every tangent is obtained this way. Let me put it in quotation. OK? So what does it mean that every tangent is obtained this way? It means that if you take a bunch of C sub i's, such that, so this is 1 over this measure, that if you take a bunch of C sub i's such that this converges to that tangent phi, the C sub i's are basically a constant of this one, OK? They're, they're the, the ratio of the two converges to a number, to a specific number, OK? So these are all the tangent measures. OK. So since I'm guessing that most of you have not worked with this concept, I would like to give you a proof of why, um, why this is the case. How on earth is that this thing guarantees that then you can have tangent measures? OK, questions? OK, so let's start. So proof. So I take this number. I remind you what this number is. This is a lens soup, so it's an inf of a soup of the same thing. And this simply means that, you know, so this, you remember what it means. So since this is 
less than CA means that if I choose that exists to see an S0 positive such that for every R less than X0, I have the soup is less, therefore mu of B of A, 2R over mu of B of AR is less or equal than CA plus 1, which I conveniently call CA prime. And this condition, which I am going to call star for today, is it plays an important role. So I'm not doing it only just to illustrate, it's because then it's at the basis of something else in Price's argument. Okay? So of course, most of every time I write theorem, they belong to Price. If they're not Price's, I will, okay, they're not mine. This is, um, this is Price's work. Okay. Might be my reinterpretation of it, but this is his work. Okay, so we have these, and so how do I get a converge? So I need to prove that given any sequence going to zero, I have a convergent subsequence. What I need to do is show that these um, measures are uniformly bounded on compact sets. That's the only tool I have, okay? So you take a compact set. My favorite compact set is the ball of center zero and radius two to the L for any L. Okay, and if I show that those are bounded, then I'm fine. So look what happens. I'm going to call mu sub i, I choose those are i's, of a set A is simply mu of rIA plus little a over mu of B of A ri. Okay, so that's that measured over there. And look what happens. Mu i of B0, 2 to the L for the name L in Z. Well, in particular, I choose it less. Let me choose it bigger or equal than zero for now. So what this means, <coughs> Ri, here, sorry. Mu of these, what is this? This is mu of B of A to L Ri over mu of B of A Ri. And if my Ri is small enough, how small? I need it to be less than 2 to, two to the L Ri better be less than S0. But for Ri large, for I large, sorry, not Ri large, for Ri large, I apply this so many times and it gives me C prime to the L, I'm guessing minus 1. Uh, that's it. Okay? I say that this one is less than what happens to L minus 1, and I apply and apply and apply, and I get there. And check it out. They're uniformly bounded. This doesn't depend on I. Provided I is large, it doesn't depend on I. And for the other ones, well, we just, it's finitely many of them. Okay? So what do I have? I have that soup in I of mu I of B0 to L for each L. This is uniformly bounded. And therefore, by the compactness theorem that I reminded you about this morning, there's a subsequence that converges. Okay? So there exists mu i k that converges. Okay. Now we need to prove that nu is not zero because that's my, um, and I'm going to do several things at the same time. So I remind you a property. Do I want to do everything at the same time? Yeah. So for an L that belongs to N, what do I want to prove? I want to prove that nu is not zero, and I want to prove that zero belongs to the support of nu. I need to do both things. I'm going to use both things. So let's look at this. What is this? Well, for sure, this is bigger than nu b0 to minus L minus 1. The closure of that ball. You know by weak conversions that this is bigger or equal than the lean soup. If you don't recall this, just take it in good faith. This time I'm not lying. Other times I will, but not this one. Okay? Let's. That's only. I drop the lin soup, i goes to infinity. This gives you mu of b0 i a 
2 to the minus L minus 1 <coughs> Ri over mu of B of A Ri. Once again, I apply my condition. These are negative. This gives me Ca prime to the minus L, which is positive. OK? What have I done? The only thing I've done here is apply this condition over and over again. OK? And look what I have proven. I have proven that nu is not 0, and 0 belongs to the support of nu. OK? So this is a case. I let, I'm going to let you convince yourself that all of them are obtained this way. But here we already have. So if we have this start condition, which I am going to call asymptotically doubling, asymptotically doubling at A. And the reason why I do that is, look, it really tells you that for us up to some, after some point, this becomes doubling. If you have that for your measure, then your tangents exist. You know how to make them appear. You know how to choose the C sub i and 0 is in the support. Okay. Questions? OK, so what do I want to do? Remember, so the, I said the goal was to prove prices, to talk about prices work. So the first thing I want to do is let's see what prices, what else we know. Because we started from a measure that, we want to start from a measure that has density. And then I put this condition. So let's, and so the algorithm didn't work again. Sorry about that. OK. So I am not going to assume that the measure I'm going to, let's assume for a minute that the measure has upper and lower density. OK? So let's assume, assume the following. So I am going to. Um, so because I haven't defined these, let me define them. Name inf as r goes to 0 of mu of b of a r over r to the n. Mu a is the limb soup as r goes to 0 of mu of b of a r over r to the n. And here is what I want. Assume that uh, that we have the following that the lower density is um, that the lower density is positive and that the upper density is finite okay then then the first thing I want to check, so let's first check that it satisfies the hidden condition. Okay, so I am trying to remember where we're going. We want to prove if what Price did is he says, if the density exists, here is what I know about the tangent measures. Okay, we're going slower. We first needed to know that some of them existed. Now I want to apply the hidden condition, the one that I call star to this one, show that these exist. See how we obtain the tangents and see what the properties of these tangents are. OK? So let's look at this condition. This tells you that these two numbers exist. Note that out of these two, let's compute. Let's look at these. Well, this is the same thing as r to the, actually, sorry. Let me do something since I care. Let me choose my, I'm going to change my n to an s. And it's, you know, it's because we have the preconceived idea that an n is an integer. 
And I want to apply this for any positive number. OK? Assume that S is a positive number. And we know this. Then R2, R2, yes, times R to the S mu of B of A R times 2 to the S. I haven't done anything other than multiply and divide by the same thing, but given the fact that's almost 5 o'clock, I think it's worth doing that. <laughs> okay, and what happens? And let look at the limb soup as R goes to 0. Okay, so limb soup as R goes to 0 of mu of b of a 2r over mu of b of ar. And you agree that's less than 2 to the s. The limb soup of these times 1 of the, over the limb inf of these, which is theta star s mu a over theta s star mu a. This is a finite number. This is a finite and positive number. This is a finite number. So the densities exist. So sorry. So the this number exists. Therefore, the tangents exist. Okay. Moreover, because I know that in the case I just did and hid conveniently, if this is bounded, I can obtain all the tangents by dividing by this guy. And in this case, what this is telling me is that this guy is more or less r to the s. In this case, all tangents, so in this, so if one holds, Let me try to write it the nicest possible. And tangent, and phi belongs to tangent of mu at a, then there exist r i's going to 0, and there exists a z0 positive, a constant, such that c0 times 1 I'm going to put it like this better. Um, such a T A R I of mu times R I to the minus S converges to C0. OK? So that means all tangents are obtained by looking at this type of dilation. OK? So in the special case where upper and lower density are bounded, the CIs are really Ri to the minus S for some Ri. OK? So condition one implies unity of strictly equality, the bound Sorry, th this is not an inequality. Okay. This is an implication. <laughs> OK, sorry. It's, I, I tried to say putting the two things together. Sorry? No, so sorry. What it, this is what implies that. All of the fact that I have a lower than, uh, yes, yes, sorry. OK. But actually, even more is true. And now, so there's, there's more than the, is true in this case. So, this is the beginning. So th this is okay. So here it is. Let's assume let s. So s is a positive number, okay? And let mu be run on in R m. And let's assume assume. upper and lower densities and I have the impression I changed the order of 
start an S here, but it's the same thing, okay? Mu almost every A. Uh, actually, no, let me assume at some point. Assume we have these. Then here is what we have. Well, um, I'm going to do something else, sorry. Let me call A the set of A's where this is the case. So let A. Then for mu almost every A in A, we have the following thing. If nu is the tangent measure of mu at A, okay, there exists a little constant C positive such that mu nu of b of x r, let me see where I'm going to put the t in the beginning, is less than c r to the s, bigger than t c r to the s. And this is true, let me tell you who everybody else. For every x in the support of nu, for every r positive, and let me tell you who t is. T here is a T of A and is the lower density over the upper density. Okay. Let me so let's take a pause and try to figure out what has happened. This morning I defined the tangent measure. When I define the tangent measure, I put a CI in front of my dilation of the measure. If I put this asymptotically doubling condition, I know what I can put as my CI. When I have an upper and a lower density, I know that I can put this number, and now I'm telling you not only is zero in the support of this measure, okay, as before, but this measure is Alfors regular with power s. I mean, for those of you who know what that is, if not, this is the definition of Alfors regular, okay? And there's a very specific t. How do you prove something like that? I'm not going to do it in detail, but you should consider this part of your um, exercise. First thing you do is you have this condition. So you s divide this set into pieces where the, the upper, uh, where these guys are almost constant. Okay, you can do that. You choose your epsilon and then you partition the set into that. Now you partition the set, each one of those sets, into pieces. Basically, you apply a graph where the condition is uniform at what speed you converge. And then you look at the properties of the limits. And you have to exchange a fair number of limits. But this is where you get. Questions? I see lots. Yes. Sorry? Is anybody? Because remember, this constant new, this measure new, if nu is a tangent, c times nu is a tangent, OK? So this nu is not the one I obtain necessarily. This little c is the same as this little c0 here, in some sense. So no, this little constant c you know, is anybody. Basically, if I, but because if I have one tangent, let's assume that I have one tangent with one specific little c, one. Then by just taking a different c, by just taking the ci, the c, little c times that one over i, r, 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 i to the s, you get it. Yeah, tangents, when I talk about a unique tangent, I mean it's unique up to multiplication by a constant, okay? It's, this is a funny uniqueness. But if, so, okay. They're only unique once you, for example, decide that the measure of the unit ball is 1. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what, what's t, uh, yeah, t, 
is the same thing as this little, this t is this little t that's here. And it is exactly this number. Okay? Okay, so let's see. So what did price do? So now price had a measure that was better than this. Actually, in fact, no, because he proved a more general theorem than the one I told you, but we're not going to go into his general theorem. We're going to prove a special case of his theorem, which is when the density exists. So let's rewrite what this means in the case where the density exists. And you'll see it's going to be. Okay, so I'm going to have to move t somewhere else because I need that piece of board there. OK, so you can, while I rewrite this, let's start thinking what happens. Once again, price. Let's assume theta s mu a 0 infinity mu almost every a in R which was Price's assumption, OK? So let's read. He assumes that this density exists almost everywhere. So that tells you the limb soup and the limb inf are the same. So that means that then mu almost everywhere. So that means the limb soup and the limb inf are the same. Therefore, t is 1. So it means that mu almost everywhere, if mu belongs to the tangent of mu at a, then nu satisfies here t is 1. This is an equality. There exists a c positive such that nu of b of x r is c r to the s for every x in the support of nu and for every r positive. OK? Stop. Uh -uh. Guess it doesn't stop. Ah, the red one. Let's see. If oh, OK. No, the red one is for the screen. There's a no, this one is for the screen. That's what Hervé said. You sure? OK, if it, there you go, it stops. Perfect. Bet. OK, so is that I want to write something in that line. And I am not tall enough to write it otherwise. OK, so let me use that line as a definition. So this is a very specific measure. It tells you that the measure of every single ball for points in the support is the same and is exactly r to the s. So this measure, nu, is s uniform. OK? And the C is the same C for everybody. OK? Everybody. OK? And S as well. OK. So this is what Price did. Remember, in Price's case, S was an integer. And I want to make a pause because this is basically how I got into this business. So let's think for a minute that S is an integer. So let's assume that you're working on a problem. You're completely unaware of Price's work. And then, but you somehow have a problem in which, because of your training, you're led to take tangents and pseudo tangents, and doesn't matter exactly what those are, and you get that they all look like that, with s equals an integer. And you are trying to prove regularity, and what's your hope? How many measures do you know? So here is the measure you have. When s is an integer, and so to emphasize, I'm going to call it n. Talking of preconceived ideas and biases, I know that you know, we cannot think of s as an integer or of n as a fractional, I mean, as a quotient. Anyway, let's assume s equals to n, so is an integer, and let's assume nu 
then Rm is a measure that satisfies nu of b of x r. And let me, I want my constant to be 1, because I like 1 for every r positive. That the constant is irrelevant, really. Supportive. How many of these do you know? Dali, don't say a word. And so the reason I say that is because this is this. So when we got here, we, meaning Carlos Koenig and I, we had a problem, and we just got that all our tangents, and we were truly unaware of um, of Spice's work, and we didn't. Our tangents didn't have density. Our tangents were for measures with different properties. We landed here. We landed that we had this, and we thought, if I have. That has to, if I have Lebesgue measured, Hausdorff measured in an n-dimensional plane, that's it. And what I wanted was to show that I blow up to something that was flat, which is, you know, a measure. So I thought, but I couldn't prove, we couldn't prove it. So what happened was, so this is many years ago. I was in Minnesota. Minnesota played a very important role for me in this area of work. First time I'm in Minnesota, and I, well, not the first time I was there, but I was there. It was a GMT conference, and I asked Fang Gualen. I mean, I asked everybody who I could find. I blow these measures and look what I get. Do you know who they are? And Fang Gua told me, you know, there's this work by this guy, Price. Go look in there. He talks about things like that. Okay? Bob Hart said, yeah, you should look at that. I mean, it's. Um, then a couple of years later, I met Price in Minnesota, Vladimir Zverev, so it, it was. But I went to look, and yeah, what you don't want it to happen, happen. There are other things besides the flat ones. So um, since I need to keep your attention for a little bit longer, I'm going to keep the suspense <laughs> till we get there. Uh, before I do that, so. Um, I want to use the technology. So as I said, Marstrand, um, so Marstrand contributed to the list this morning, but Marstrand was interested in something else. Marstrand was interested on what happens when s is not an integer. So choose your favorite thing, pi over 3, for example. OK, so here is what Marsha, Marstrand proved. He didn't prove it the way I'm going to sketch the proof. I am going to use, I want to sketch a proof because, OK, so in, in prices, if you ask me what, what are the key things that Price introduced in this piece of his paper, he introduced the notion of tangent measures. He introduced the notion of moments. And he talked about the structure of the cones of measures. Okay? And he and the moments are the very, very, very important part, but is a part that I will not have time to describe in detail. So what I'm gonna do is I will do during the week two or three arguments that give you a flavor of what the moments are without giving the full blown definition of the moments, but at least to convince you that these things are important things. Okay, and I will tell you who the moments are. So the next theorem, which I'm going to state, is Marstrand's theorem, but the proof is a proof that uses Price's technology. Okay, so that was not what Marstrand did. Okay, yeah. Is fractal related to such a non-flat uh, tangent? What do mm, um, or, um, What do you exactly want to mean by fractal? Mm -hmm. I can have things that behave that are really close relative to fractals that I produce by doing self similar, well, almost self similar construction such that all their tangents are flat, but they are not rectifiable. So the issue, it, it has to do with also uniqueness. Okay? You can have things, of course, if you have a very, you know, you can have fractals, and when you blow up, then you, of course, don't have a flat tangent. 
but you can also think that have things that blow up. All their blow ups are flat, but they're f as far from rectifiable as you want. Okay? So it's. Um, okay. Maybe as we go along, you'll get to see a little bit more. But so let me let me state Marshall's theorem. So theorem. Yes, of course. Oh, the support of mu and the support of tangent measure are completely different. Let me give you my measure is mu is by length here. When I blow up at this point, the, ta the, su the tangent nu is supported over here and is a, it's a multiple of, um, of the Lebesgue measure here. Yes. Maybe that was the question over there. So uh, such a uniform measure, which is not flat, was constructed by David Price. And the example, as far as I remember, is some quadratic surface or something of that kind, I guess. Oh, but a quadratic surface is flat. You, no, no, I, I told you that was my punchline. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? <laughs> I no sorry so I, I misunderstood the question. I said that not all n uniform um, measures with n an integer, not all of them are flat. You are correct. An example, the only known example, was constructed by Kowalski and Price. But and I'm going to tell you who the example is, but I don't want to tell you now because you see, we still have like almost an hour to go. It's really late for you. It's even later for me. So if I tell you now, I kill the suspense. You see? Okay. Yes. So I do not remember and you will tell me. Later. Yes. You see, you were not paying attention to that part already. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Please ask question. I, I promise I won't be mean. Yeah. Just one last. Yes. So, um, what kind of uh, assumptions would we make at as minimal as possible to guarantee the, the flatness of support of tangent? What would we uh, support on, on mu? It would be absolutely lovely if I could answer that question. So there are no simple conditions just on mu that you guarantee that you have a flat measure because as it was mentioned so maybe it's time to give you see okay so I'm gonna tell I'm gonna show you I'm gonna show you the example I will tell you how it came about later because it's something that I'm gonna do but let's assume we are in the simplest possible case okay so so this was not Marstrand okay now let's assume this is where we are Okay, so I'm not going to give you all the information. Uh -huh. and let's, uh, so we have equality, exact equality. And so this is a result of Kowalski and Price. So modulo rotation and translation, one or two things can happen. Okay, so the support of new, so modulo rotation plus translation. Either n equals 1 or 2, OK? And in that case, the nu is, nu is flat, which means nu is C H n restricted to V, which is, this is an n plane. And n plane here is absolutely deceiving. It means a line or a two plane. or so I'm, I'm just going to give you examples, OK? So let's assume for a minute that m is n plus 1. So I am telling you all the truth, OK? So I'm talking about co-dimension 1. The only other example known is the following, is x1, x2, xn plus 1. Remember, and that means with the condition x4 squared equals x1 squared, x2 squared plus x3 squared. OK? 
so this is the light cone. The light cone times the right number of r's is the only other example. x4 squared equals x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. That's the only other example. Only in Only, no, in co-dimension 1 is the only other example. If you are right, in higher co-dimensions, no other examples are known. No examples other than these ones are known. I will tell you later what's known. Okay? There's been. So what, what is the inducer? Is that the, 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 these are the only inductors possible? What? In co-dimension one, if you are the support of an n-uniform measure, co-dimension one, you're either a flat, you're either a line here. Here, of course, if, so I should have said, if n is greater or equal than 3, you have nu is either the support of nu. So I should have said, since this is the support, I should have said modular rotation and translation. If n is equal to 1 or 3, you have r n. So that's an option. So. Maybe I should write it like this. It's either Rn, or if n is greater or equal than 3, you have this option over here. Okay? And that's it. There's nobody in co-dimension 1, there's nobody else. And I will show you not the full proof, but half of the proof. Okay? And so let me tell you. Now I'm already falling out of order, but so how was this proved? Well, what happens is, as I said, he introduced the they introduced the moments, <coughs> um, and they prove that if you are an n-uniform measure, you live inside a quadratic. That we'll see. And then Kowalski, who was a differential geometer, what he did is he said, well, if you have a measure that satisfies this, this is a this is basically the volume at smooth points. I'll tell you why you can say that this happens often. At smooth points, you have a Taylor expansion for the volume. Okay? The Taylor expansion, the vol volume, has a first term. So, well, that is exactly that. Plus, when you do the Taylor expansion, the, there's no term in R. There's a term in R squared that involves curvature. There's a term in R4 that involves a differential and PDE on curvature, and by solving that, you figured out who everybody is. Okay? But, but, so unfortunately, I cannot put a condition just on the measure. That shows that I cannot put a condition just on the measure that, con that is flat. On the other hand, since this is going to be a very important part of of all the argument, let's look at the difference between Rn at the cone. You might see some differences. Here's the difference I want you to focus on. The plane is like that. It's flat. The cone, away from here, who cares what happens here? Over there is very far away from flat. Okay? No matter what flat is, this is very, well, at infinity, this is far away from flat. And Rn is flat. And that will play an important role in this argument. Okay. Questions? Okay, so let's go to Marstra. Okay. Fair. So, Martian, 54. And here is what he said. He said, assume theta s mu a exists and is positive and finite on a, on a, where mu of A has positive measure, then S is an integer. Okay? 
So that's why from now on when we go to an integer, we're not lie. Okay. Let me let's let's use everything that we've learned so far to do this proof. Okay, so by what we just did, which is hopefully over there, if we blow up this measure, okay, so proof. Step one, <coughs> for every ohm new in ohm, you know, so. For mu almost every A, if nu belongs to tangent mu of A, nu is S uniform. So to prove that S is an integer, what we're going to assume is that S is not an integer. And if S is not an integer, then to prove that we get to a contradiction, what we need to prove is that there exists no, no S uniform measures. Think of S as pi over 3 no s uniform measures in any rn okay because that's because if it were then you will obtain them as tangent measures okay so and remember zero belongs to the support i actually <coughs> i would like to use that okay so to show the theorem enough to show that if nu is S uniform in Rm, then S is an integer. Okay? And so let's make sure. So are we all okay with that simplification? assume not. Assume S is not an integer and let M be the smallest number such that an S, a non-integer, an S uniform measure in Rm exist. Okay? So I go to the smallest possible one. The first thing I know is that S is strictly less than M because S is not an integer and M is an integer. Okay? The support is close. Therefore, so S is less than M, and actually I want to um, claim that there exists a point Z. Sorry, let me call it correctly. There exists a point Z that belongs to Rm minus the support of nu, and Z is not zero. So because, <coughs> okay? Sorry? Do you have a question? Okay, so let's assume, so it's not Z, so I have somebody in there. So let me draw the picture. The support of my measure me lives somewhere here. I don't know where, of course, I'm drama, you know, I'm doing this a beautiful picture. And I have a point Z, which is not in the support. I'm going to put it here. And because the support is closed, I can draw the ball. I'm going to draw the ball first and then I put my point Z. Z is here. I can draw the ball, the largest ball that is outside of this support. So there exists a row positive such that B row of Z naught is outside of the support. Remember, this set is closed. That's important. 
but this guy intersects the support. And this point where it intersects is, I'm going to call it y0 here. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, it's the same. Yes. Yeah, no, but it's because I already was putting the y0. Let me not change who it is because it, it thank you. It's not a good time to have a typo here. OK? OK. Um, and and remember, this new we're talking about is S uniform. So one of the things that we talked about was that tangents exist almost everywhere. You should ask me. That allows me to stop. No, huh? OK, so let me. The picture is D. So this is the same picture as the other side. I have a Z. The Z is a point that doesn't belong to the Z doesn't, so the support is here. Z is not on the support. And Y is a point here that belongs to the support and is at the distance. OK? That's what it says over there. And this is an S uniform measure. And I said that tangents exist almost everywhere, but for these S uniform measures, they exist everywhere. Before they existed almost, almost everywhere. So here is what I'm going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to blow up the measure nu at the point y naught. OK? So, so let me ask. So you cannot see over there, and I'm guessing you cannot see over here. So what part of the board is visible to everybody? This one <laughs> over here. <laughs> OK, let's do the argument there, because I want people to see. Now, but it's also that I'm caught in the bottom board, because if I go to the top board now, I hide what I, what I wrote. OK. It's not wide enough. <laughs> OK, try to write harder. I, pr I won't promise. OK, so what I want to do now is I want to blow up. So the idea is blow up new at x naught, at y naught. OK, I can do that. I am blowing up and um, So let me see. Oh, I changed my notation. I hate when I do this. OK. So guys, I, I just changed my notation from that of my notes. That's a very bad sign at this point. I want to blow up nu at why not. Let's think for a minute what happens, OK? So the blow up, I obtain phi is S uniform, OK? Because when I blow up an S unif this function, the density, I mean, the thing exists. is one everywhere. It's S uniform. What else happens? Let's think for a minute. When we blow up, we are dilating. So I don't know which picture you prefer. I am dilating this one. Let's dilate this picture. Well, this is becoming flatter, even if it were not smooth. The important thing is that the ball, that one I know, is becoming flatter. OK? So what's going to happen is that 
the support of the new measure is going to live in the lower half plane. OK? So if I call E, and let me sh make sure that I get the right sign here. If E is y naught minus z over y naught minus z, then the support of the measure phi, this blow up, is inside the point x in Rm such that x times E is greater or equal than 0. OK? Question? This is purely, uh, you know, geometric. <clears throat> and now, 0 still is in the support of phi. And now we're going to look at the center of mass. OK? B sub r, center of mass. So I said this uses the moment. The center of mass is basically the first moment. And what is it? It's phi of b of r, the integral over b of r of z d phi of z. OK? And so we have two cases. Either there is a br for it is an R for which BR is 0. OK? No, sorry. Either for every R, BR is 0, or there's an R for which is not 0. OK, so let's do the two cases. Case, case 1. For every R, BR is 0. Case 2. <clears throat> there exists an R for which BR is not 0. OK, I'm going to try again. I'm going to try this side. OK, let's do the easy case first. BR is 0 for every z. Okay, so assume 1, BR is 0 for every r. So now let's take a y. Let's take E. So here is my E. And let's do the inner product, BR times Z. So this is 0, because BR is 0. And it's the same thing as 1 over phi of, of the ball of radius R, BR, Z, E, D, phi. OK? And z e on the support of phi is greater or equal than 0. So this is the integral of a function that is greater or equal than 0, but the integral is 0. The function is 0 everywhere. So z e is 0 almost everywhere. So in particular, the support of phi actually, since it's closed, this is inside, and that's a continuous function is in here. And this is an m minus 1 dimensional vector space. And so this contradicts the fact that m was the smallest place where an s-uniform measure could live. OK? So that's a contradiction. So we only have one case left, the case where there exists an R, such that BR is different than zero. OK? <coughs> and let me see what happens there. OK, so. Um, so now we're going to deal with the case where b of r is not 0 at that 1r. And I don't know if this is the wisest move, but we are going to do a computation. So after 5, and we're going to compute something. <coughs> the only thing you need to know here is you know, Fubini's theorem. So what am I trying to do? I am trying to show 
that if BR is not zero at some point, then when you do BR with the inner product of BR and anybody in the support goes to zero like quadratic. And that will tell us something. Okay? So let me let's do that computation. And this is really so think of these as your first direct encounter with the moments, even if I haven't defined what they are, even if I haven't said anything. So I am trying to prove that, so let me, I should maybe tell you what I'm trying to prove. I'm trying to prove that if I take a point y, in the support of phi, this goes to 0, this behaves like that for y less than r over 2 maybe. Yes? On every, every radius? No. 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 What you, so the question is, and then I'll erase this, OK? So assume mu of b of x r equals phi r uh, for every x in the support. If you tell me for every x in rm, then it's a different story. But for every x in the support. OK? If you take it for all x in Rm, then yes, basically. I, I think then you can, again, blow up the uh, Br. You know? you, this guy here, yeah. this guy here has not every phi r. That's the first thing, is that not every, so phi is any function, not, so depending depending on phi is, either these guys exist or don't exist. But for the phi's for which these guys could exist, and if you look in Price's theorem, there is somewhere there that tells you which times of functions are good candidates for phi r. And just to give you an example, of course I don't remember which one. The ball is outside. The ball, the ball was outside. So when I blow up new, my measure lives down here. Yes, I know. So that, that means the center of mass is not anymore at the, at the same point. Right? That's, that's our assumption now. The center of mass is not at the origin. The yes. center of mass. How about you let me do what I'm going to do, and then we can discuss about how mine is different than yours, OK? okay. Thank you. OK. I'm going to blow up the measure, but I need to know a little bit more than simply blow up. Because if I don't have any more information, I'm not going to get anywhere. OK? So let's go ahead to the computation. So I am at a b of r that is not 0. And for all that I know, maybe there's only one of those. OK? And I am going to do a computation. So let's take y somebody in the support of nu. And let's look at b of y r. I want to look at this number. r squared x minus y squared. Oh, God. And this is a support of phi. And this is because I changed the notation with my notes. OK, let's do this. What is this? This is nothing else than the integral from 0 to r squared of phi of x 
And here this r squared minus x minus y squared is bigger than t dt. And this is the same as the integral from 0 to r squared once I rearrange th everything. The ball of <coughs> centered y and radius r squared minus t dt. OK? I, I just simply put x minus y here, put the t, the, the integral. The ball is, this is the measure of all balls are roughly the same. So this tells me this is the integral of 0, y. Actually, they're exactly the same. b of 0 square root of r squared minus t, dt. And this is the same thing. I just re-unraveled b0 r of r squared minus x squared. Okay. What does this prove? I mean, this is the first example that integration of radially symmetric functions is the same. If I assume the measures of all balls are the same, it's not surprising that the integration of all radially symmetric functions are the same. Okay. What is this going to accomplish? Well, remember, I'm trying to get here. So now I'm going to have, I'm going to write, I want to make that thing appear. So r squared minus x squared minus r squared minus x minus y squared. I know it looks like very complicated, but bear with me for the second. This is nothing else than y squared minus 2xy. OK. And now I want to estimate, notice, 2BRY. Why I put a 2? Because I have a 2 here. OK, so I have a 2. What I do is I integrate everything with respect to x. OK, I'm going to do d phi x here. So I do that, that. And here is what I have. I'm only going to do a tiny bit of the computation. I let you finish the computation. It gives you. A two <coughs> phi of this is just the definition b r of x y d c and now I use that this is y squared minus one over phi b r the integral over b r of r squared minus x squared d phi. I have another piece plus the other piece, the integral over br of r squared x minus y squared d phi. OK? And now I use the fact that this thing that is um, an integral over the ball of radius r can be written as an integral of, of the ball of radius yr. OK? And I say, well, so I'm not going to do that. But basically, if I take a y that is less than r, <coughs> OK, so what do I want to do? Let's, I'm going to write this as an integral over the ball of center y and radius r of the same thing. So I have at least the same function, but in two different sets. OK? Now, yes? Do you have a question? Oh, I decided, yes. Um, sorry? Yes, exactly. 
And I want to point out that I did this computation. I didn't need here the fact that the specific, the only thing I have used here is the, measure, is the fact that the measure of all balls are the same. It could have been the function phi r that I was putting before. So some of these things don't even have to do with the fact that you have r to a power. And you are very correct. When you have an r to the, when is an integer, what this tells you is that the, huh? Which, oh, but no, this was, this is not a radially symmetric function. It's only true for radially symmetric function. Sorry? This one? But, so when I do this one, this is the integral, I agree with you, is the integral over, of the same function, but over the different ball. This thing over here, if you look at what the board says over there, this is b r y of r squared x minus y squared dt. So it's not over the same ball. OK? On the other hand, if I choose y less or equal than r, and something is telling me that I prefer to chase less than r over 2, but yes, that's correct, r over 2. Then, then we can estimate, we can est we look at, we bound these by the function on b r y minus b r and vice versa. Okay, so I, I'm saying from now on you can do this computation and what ends up happening is the following. So by writing these like these and seeing which balls are included in which balls, you end up proving that this is bounded by y squared. And I'm going to give you a hint so that if you try to reproduce it, it's not so horrible. C of br. And here I put phi of b r y minus b r plus phi of b r minus b r y. Okay, and when you compute that, since you know what these measures are, and you do an estimate, roughly speaking, you get that 2 br y is bounded by a constant that depends on r times y squared. Okay? Which was where I wanted to get. There's one y squared here. And you can believe me that there's going to be another y squared because look what happens. For example, this one, I am going to write this as a b r minus b r minus y zero. And now there's a y that appears here, and there's a y that appears here that gives you your y squared. Okay? So <coughs> what on earth am I going to do with that? I'm going to blow up. You're correct, I have to blow up again to be able to. But how do you do? So let's think for a minute. What we get is that if I multiply upon in y in that ball and in the support with respect to the center of mass is decaying as y gets smaller and smaller, this goes to z. I mean, this, you know, this is linear. This is quadratic. Okay? Has to be. This has to be zero. The only linear function that's bounded by a quadratic function as, well as you're going to zero is zero. So that's what we have to show. Okay. So, so there is a kosher way to do it, and there's a non-kosher way to do it. Given the time, I'm going to do the non-kosher way. I'm going to wave my hands, and if you have questions, come see me afterwards. Okay, so I'm going to give you a proof that hope you believe is not quite correct, but it's a good idea of what's happening. Okay, so I blow up again. Okay, so now blow up phi at zero, <coughs> which is the point why not that you were referring. But I needed to have this additional information to make this blow up useful at zero. And so, and let lambda 
be the tangent measured of phi at 0 that is obtained by doing so. R i to the minus s t 0 r i converges to lambda. OK? <coughs> and so I am going to do, as I said, I'm going to do the non-kosher way. I'll explain why this is correct. And then you can do it. If you want, see me afterwards. And so if I blow up what I am doing to the points, I am basically dividing by, remember what this is, t0 ri over point y is simply y minus 0 over ri. So let's do that to the point. So this gives me a 2. I don't know why I insist on the 2. b over ri is less than cr y over ri squared times ri. OK? I didn't do anything other than divide by ri. Because what this is telling me is that as I blow up the set, the support of the measure, and this is, this is an important statement, but I'm going to shuffle under the rod. What we know is that 1 over ri, the support of the measure phi, converges in the Hausdorff distance sense to the support of lambda. Hausdorff distance uniform on compact set. OK, so we let ri go to 0. Here, of course, the y's are changing. I mean, if I fix my y, everybody is 0, but the y's are changing. And so what happens, out of here I get that for every z that belongs to the support of lambda, 2 br lambda is less or equal than 0, because this is going to z, sorry, br z, and this is going to 0. OK? And therefore, the support of lambda lives in the orthogonal to this guy, which is an m minus 1. So lambda, I should have said, lambda is, again, s uniform, because the blow up of an s uniform measure is s uniform. And this is m minus 1 dimensional, which is a contradiction again. OK? So <coughs> there is a correct way to do this by looking at the set where in the limit this is bigger than something and proving that that set has lambda measure 0. And OK, so this tells you that s has to be an integer, because when we assume that s wasn't an integer, we got a contradiction. Why did I do this? Well, because it was an illustration of the techniques, but I did something that I hope you, that we will do a lot of. So what did we do? We started with a new measure. OK, we blew it up once. We got something. Half of the time it worked. The other half, I didn't work. I blew it up a second time. We got what we wanted. So the process that we have done is we have blow up, we've done blow ups of blow ups. And the natural question is, if I start with a measure, mu, for example, our original measure. I blow up once, I get a tangent measure. I blow up the tangent measure. What do I get? I, well, I get something else. But what's the relationship of this one over here? to the one I started with. And so the relationship is that tangents to tangents are tangents. And we will talk about that. That's where I'll start. Um, tomorrow is a very important concept and is what will allow us to do lots of the things that we need to do. Okay? So let me finish here for today.